coming up on Call of Duty 1 was a big challenge. We weren't sure which direction we wanted to take it. Come behind the scenes with Infinity War as they face the challenges and triumphs of creating Call of Duty 2. When we first started out, Infinity Ward was 22 members of the Medal of Honor Allied Assault team that worked out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 2002, Infinity Ward began work on the original Call of Duty. We knew that we had money. We were just, this is money. We put it on the table. You need to play this. The news of that prototype just went through Activision like wildfire. The game quickly evolved into a groundbreaking departure for World War II first-person shooters, earning it over 80 Game of the Year awards. That set like a pretty high bar for Call of Duty 2. What are we going to do differently? How are we going to top that? Well, one of the things about Call of Duty 1 uh, where some people felt it was a little too linear, so we wanted to open up the gameplay. This required reinventing the AI completely because we didn't know which direction the player would be approaching the objective from. So you can't just pre-plan a course and do a series of scripted events. You need to really algorithmically figure out how to respond to what the player is going to do from any angle. So we had to create very autonomous AI, AI that could retreat from this position, can set up ambushes, can try to flank the player. They've got vision cones, hearing radiuses. They're just much more self-aware than they were in Call of Duty 1. And that was a huge, huge change, a huge overhaul. And it caused us to basically throw out the Call of Duty 1 engine and create our own proprietary technology. There were a lot of challenges that we encountered. Basically, we just made the level we wanted to make and played the game and watched where the AI fell down, but then had to go to the drawing board and try to figure out how to, how to solve these problems. So we did that for a year and a half, basically, just constantly working on the AI, improving it, tweaking it, tuning it until we got to the point where we liked it. So one of the things that came out of the nonlinear gameplay mixed with the all new AI was how do we make this AI even more important to the player and make him appreciate his friendly troops more. And basically what came out of that was the concept of this battle chatter system, where the AI understand the field of battle, they call out enemy troops, they call out position. Now we made the AI so autonomous that they knew where they were, wherever they were on the map any location, if they were on the second floor of a building, if they were behind a wall. They had to know exactly where their surroundings were. Your AI is very self-aware and they're telling you what their current situation is, what the enemy is doing. And really brings that player in, into being part of that squad. And for any of our fans that speak German, you can hear that we brought that same contact sense of the battle chatter system over to the Germans. We came up with true military terms, how they actually communicate with each other, as well as look at all the levels in the game and geometry and basically gave it all names. Then we had to record over 20,000 lines of dialogue, put that in code, you know, so that the AI knows about it. One of the big challenges was striking just the right sweet spot. We didn't want it happening too much because then it's just noise and the face in the background. If it happens not enough, it's not as useful to the player as it could be. We have two military advisors that were really instrumental with developing Call of Duty. We asked them, what, what were the things that were missing from Call of Duty 1 that you see on the battlefield, that you experienced every day? And they said, well, there's portable concealment. concealment aka smoke has been used in warfare for over 150 years and there's none of it in Call of Duty 1. So we created this really robust particle system it just adds a real level of immersion that we didn't have before. We have a lot of great level designers who do a lot of research and are inspired by real events so on the Duhok level for example you know the rangers actually did scale the the cliff face and the guns had actually been moved and they did actually have to go find the guns. We storyboard out this stuff and it was soldiers start on the Higgins boat on the way in, soldiers are on the beaches, soldiers scale the cliffs. It was a lot more complicated when we implemented it than what we saw just from the storyboards. That whole level took a massive effort from a large group of people for a few months before we had uh, the E3 trade show and 
you know, two weeks in and you're just like, I don't see it, you know, three weeks in, don't see it, four weeks in, there's something going on here, five weeks in, wow, we got some magic. Keeping up their high standards for authenticity, the team did extensive research, including sending design teams to North Africa and France. We had an artist and a game designer to check out what a real North African village looks like. We also sent um, a few artists to Normandy to check out French villages. There's a big difference between how Americans perceive a French village and how they really are laid out. And it really kind of caused a big redesign for a lot of stuff. Probably the, the biggest challenge that we had, I think maybe a month into development of that, Microsoft came to Activision and said, we want Call of Duty to be a launch title exclusive to the Xbox 360. We told them it's not going to be a problem, we're going to knock it out of the park. And we got back to our office and we are like, okay, we have to somehow plan to use a bunch of art techniques that haven't been invented yet, so let's design those in. We need to design the game for hardware that doesn't exist. We need to schedule out workflows for people who we haven't even hired yet. I think that was just a real kind of amazing thing, how you can kind of visualize how this stuff is going to work out, how you're going to hire these people, how you're going to work on this hardware. And just through sheer force of will and people working late hours and having a lot of passion, how it just all really kind of came together. My name is Leonard G. Lomel. I was first sergeant of D Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion, United States Army, in World War II. I entered the service in June of 1942, and I was discharged in 1945. Rangers are special to me because they know we accept no excuses. They're always truthful, they're always hardworking. Their main objective all the time is to accomplish the mission. My first combat is such was D-Day. Lots of things happened when we landed. I was the first man wounded in my company, shot through the right side into the flesh, which didn't keep me down, knocked me down, and burned like the dickens. But we had to put down that flight on the beach and run to the ropes. We had to find a rope that we could climb and jerk on it enough to have it satisfy yourself that it's dug in up there hundreds of feet up. We could climb the ropes as quickly as we could. And never did they ever dream anybody would be crazy enough to climb those cliffs to attack the mirror. We went on and we ran into the Germans. They bunched up and we had a firefight with them. And uh, I just jumped from one crater to another crater whenever the timing was right. And the first part of the mission, of course, was finding guns and destroying the guns. Well, we got over there, there wasn't anything in the uh, three gun emplacements that uh, were assigned at my company, D Company. We found uh, a road heading inland, uh, went down and it was a road between two hedgerows. We noticed that there was uh, something heavy, like a wagon loaded with whatever, uh, had been over it. Uh, but it could just as easily been the wheels of these 155 millimeter coastal artillery pieces. Uh, we didn't know, and no other choice. We weren't pulling off some brilliant act here and solving where the guns are. We just took the first bit of evidence and I ran down to the hedgerow ahead, and there they were. When I went in, I said, Jack, you take your head spot there. There's a lot of foliage there. You hide in that foliage. You, because I had seen, and he did too, 
about 75 to 100 men, uh, maybe 75 to 100 yards away. They never dreamed there was that two American soldiers near them. Uh, they didn't know the Rangers were that far. They didn't know the Rangers were coming, of course. And it was during those few minutes that I was able to at least set those semi grenades, as they became known as, on the traversing mechanism of the guns. I think we had them out of action totally before 8.30 in the morning, which was tremendous because we prevented those ships from being set up. And the landing areas that all those beaches on Omaha Beach and west of Omaha Beach were in the range, and, and uh, Utah Beach. Uh, so that saved the guys on those beaches. We get sick and tired of the word hero because we have so many friends that died, given their life uh, for America. And uh, to me, they'll always be our hero. And that goes for the guys that didn't get decorated. God, there are many guys uh, that didn't get the recognition that they deserved. We worked hard at being the best of the best, and we all held our own. This executive officer, he was a general, brigadier general, said, all right, so you're Rangers. Well, then lead the way, Rangers, and that became our motto ever after. It is to the present day. Rangers, lead the way. And we did. Hi, this is Jason West. This is Steve Fakuda. This is Vince Sampella. I'm Mackie McCandlish. And this is Ian Riki. So, Steve, <laughs> talk about what this used to be. This right used in. to be a very talkative sequence. The AI saying things like, Where are we going, sir? So El what, like, sir? El what, sir? And it's just silly. Very and so, lovely. one day, for the longest time, we had Steve's voice in there, too. Yeah, the it's annoying. So I just said, okay, I don't want to hear this anymore. And uh, we would tempt it. For a moment, we tempt it with little James Brown. And <laughs> it was like <laughs> Pulp Fiction. More it was like Pulp Fiction. It was kind of funny. And then I got serious, and then we replaced it with some other music that was more appropriate. And then it really gave the whole thing its sort of serious sense that makes right. it actually feel cool. And then we started showing the game to to press and we couldn't use any kind of tempted music so Steve actually posted some stuff over the weekend and we put that in. This part used to start with the whole situation with just guys standing there, there was no fighting going on and it wasn't very Call of Duty and you go up and talk to your commanding officer and then all of a sudden he gets sniped and everybody runs for cover and you the randomly blows up die. Somehow. Yeah and the building wouldn't blow up until you actually looked at it. Which there, there was a tank that would be. drive up and destroy the building. Yeah, so it made the, the building blow up back on the right end, and you could actually see it. Now, that spot right there where they just crossed, uh, a lot of uh, testers get hung up kind of standing there shooting at the MD-42. So we've done a lot of work to kind of usher people to the right, flank to the right, go to the right. Yeah, there's an animation on McGregor. He's telling you to go, and all these friendlies run around here. Yeah, we've got four friendlies that swing around to the right to give you a hint. Oh, nice good. And these guys were, these Germans here, I mean, they're part of the late edition revamp of the level to... Uh, make it more interesting. It's always neat to see players actually often are very inclined to follow their friendlies, whereas as a game developer I'm usually just trying to break things. The way, the way the player played that section was pretty perfect. <laughs> just grenade spam and, and don't, typically you don't want to let the Germans get a foothold because once they're entrenched they're much more difficult so if you can get them on the way to their cover that's the, the best time to go. Yeah I've been a little slow and had a, uh, a real hard time in that section got to be careful because the AI will throw back grenades. That's why sometimes you'll see uh, an explosion in midair. That's usually from an AI who's seen it back. On the higher difficulty levels, the AI are much more likely to throw grenades, whereas on the lower ones, they're basically not allowed to. And if you play on veteran, the AI can throw as many grenades as they want, and that's very, very dangerous. We used to have that uh, rooftop lined with enemies that would also be raining fire down on you, but we removed it because it was a little too hard. It was also confusing to players, usually. Yeah, because they wanted to hang out and fight instead of swing around.
So that goes to the doorway to hint to go in there. And this is like a super interior decorated room by one of our environmental artists. This is one of the more linear levels. It started as a completely non-linear level of where you go from hard point to hard point in whatever order you wanted with all sorts of objectives on the compass. But it uh, was too tight and didn't have any direction or moments. It was basically only fun if you took certain paths. So we decided to make sure that you took those paths. This level probably got redone the most. Yeah, I think all told, uh, it was about eight months spent on this level. Something like that. Not counting environmental artists' time. It was always one of the prettier levels, though. Yeah. Even from the very, very beginning. And now this is uh, going to be the demo level, so you'll probably see a lot of it. And those airplanes flying overhead were always there from the beginning. That was something we added right here. There used to be like one lone flat gun out there. This is like the pretty lame. Burnville times three part where it's a, to some degree an homage to first game, but it's like the first game 10x. Yeah, it really came in and tried to 10x this level. It was our first level. Yeah. yeah. So this was sort of the, the blueprint that we'd use for future development for the rest of the levels. Right. There was a certain degree of false starts on Call of Duty 2, and it's something that we go through on every game where we take stock of where we are and then reshuffle the deck and start over to some degree and uh, figure out exactly what we need to do to make the game good. Start over is kind of a strong, strong <laughs> word. But Whenever you yeah. experiment, there's going to be you know, some things. Not everything can be a success, so then you, you distill it down to its best attributes. You should definitely shoot the red barrels when you're coming through here. That's just... Cool. But the first shot set, sets them on fire, and then second and third shots make them blow up. I missed red barrels on Call of Duty 1, so. <laughs> no shortage of crates and barrels. Any proper game. Yeah, so I think our process uh, is very iterative, and the more we uh, are allowed to kind of change the game, the more time we have to do that, uh, the better it becomes. The gameplay really gets tight, the moments really come together. Like the, the planes you see flying overhead, I mean that was it. That was like an experiment people started doing right after Call of Duty 1. And did, they said, hey, maybe we'll do some flight paths with animations in Maya instead of using uh, splines. It's pretty cool as to the ambience. And all those AI yeah, we just saw were doing our new traverse where they uh, jump over objects, but they do it so their hand lines up right with the uh, surface they're jumping over. That's really cool. Yeah, I believe that's actually one of those where it's randomly not the same yeah, animation it'll pick different time, animations, which really adds a lot. <laughs> Cinematic intensity, right? I love the yeah, the AI will run around and they'll set up MG42s based on where the player is. You want to generally try to stop them before they actually get them set up. I fought the make binoculars standard edition of Call of Duty 2, so if you like them, write a letter. <laughs> so you have a lot of opportunities to flank around and come at them from the side. Yeah, you don't have to go around this way, you can go the other way too. Yeah, you can throw grenades up there too, it's good, yeah. Having the uh, sandbags and flags really made this feel like an important place, this particular building. I remember the day that we did that. Yeah, that was one of the things during the uh, the reshuffling of the deck, as Matty put it, where we just like, there's not enough swastikas and flags on this game. We also wanted to make this a more significant objective where you feel like you're accomplishing something, so we made it be all about blowing up the boats in the harbor after you take out the flax so that your boats in the distance, which you may or may not have noticed are there, can continue unharmed. And, uh, this one doesn't come across quite as clearly as some of the other objectives. It's a very, it's very well mistaken for an aircraft bombing run. Yeah, I'm sure we'll very well. see they're marking with the orange smoke now that you've destroyed the flax and now... But people like explosions. Yeah, make sure you look to the right. <laughs> <laughs> very see the boats. ships in the distance? Those are, our, those are your boats. Really so flashes. Where's the binoculars? <laughs> There's really the plane to go by, they enter the confusion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good 
people always think planes are bombing. Artillery is a concept, doesn't it? They go. As long as they feel like they accomplished something. The players using a Thompson, which they actually did use in, in the British Army. A useful uh, tip is to uh, always run over your dead friendlies and pick up more Thompson ammo because the Germans aren't going to drop any for you. <laughs> or you can get a bar. The bar is pretty cool too. Friend. Oh yeah, the friend. Those were switchy. Yeah, we added those for uh, level specific flip flip flops. Oh, wow. yeah. And there's the famous door moment. Yeah, so that was Went sort of much iteration. Yeah. <laughs> That was a spontaneous thing, sort of, during a, a level review. Well, it so felt it's... like you always have these guys kicking doors open for you, so, you know, a player's going to get used to seeing them kick the door. What if we just have the guy actually get killed, and it gives you something you're not expecting at all that surprises the player? That always got uh, lots of oohs and ahs at E3. I mean, we're not really so much about the gratuitous destruction of your friendlies, but if it's to make the moment come to life. Just another good opportunity to see some swastikas. I also felt like this was one of the best imagery so moments in the game. Moment. Yeah, that uh, the hole in the wall provides a great frame to kind of let the background stand out. It's like the 180 Twiggins Alley. We're not going to actually see that on this playthrough, this but is, it looks this great. Is, this me. is a scam to anti-binocular propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> So if you don't like binoculars, make sure you send that letter too. I don't know if a lot of Oh, oh that was nice. Okay, we got a ragdoll going on there. Yeah, this visual represents a lot of different departments coming together really well. And a lot of the way, you know, the effects team and the art team and the level design team and the code team work really well together. To really got everything going on in this scene. One thing I like to do when I get to this part is throw just lots of smoke into that area and just run through there in the smoke and the friendlies will jump after me and start cleaning up some of these Germans. There's a lot of opportunities to use smoke in this level. Yes. This is also uh, in North Africa, which is one of the new campaigns in uh, Call of Duty 2 new setting, you know, vastly different from uh, any of the other settings, so. Throwing the grenade around the blind corners, always a good practice. Yeah, often it's good to throw more than one since that one didn't work. You can always, sometimes the AI often you know, will run away. Yeah, you're always going to get more, so just... Yeah, that's a valid joke. Room, on it. room cleaning technique is, you know, throwing the grenades, then pick up their grenades and keep going. It might not be... Uh completely obvious, but the pistols are actually really useful weapons, and they let you run faster in this game when you're using a pistol, so what you can do is you can get close to a German that's using an automatic weapon, and after he empties his clip, rather than uh, try to reload right in front of you, he'll throw his gun down and pull out a pistol, so you wait till he does that and then kill him, and then you can get, a, get his pistol. Ah, uh, so 1997. Make sure you can't miss those documents. <laughs> Make them glow. Players appreciate the glow. We do a lot of testing, and anytime anybody, anything's not glowing, they, people tend to miss it. We used to have the end music kick in right about here, but uh, sometimes players would uh, like to hang out here and just sort of messed up the flow of the music. So we moved it a little bit. Mm, interesting playthrough. <laughs> Let's explore the block <laughs> with the freaking cart. This used to be the hardest spot in the game. There were enemies up here on the left at that window shooting at you, and it took me 20 tries to get through it. Yeah, we, we argued a lot about whether or not we wanted to lose that building fight. It was tough. I mean, this is really a very tight area, though, so there's only so much you can do. Yeah, it was better just to, to end the level in a good spot. It was one of those hard edits. And a lot of the uh, the detail stuff that you see came from uh, sent our artists over to North Africa to take texture reference and stock of, of what was over there. Oh, they're from Spice's face. And watch, they're carrying the smile on the champagne bottle. That's pretty cool. Watch the smile, watch the smile. Uh, yeah, there it is. Hi, I'm 
Jason West. I'm Steve Fakuda. I'm Vince Zampella. I'm Mackie McCandlish. I'm Zed Riki. What you're looking at here is Tank Hunt, one of our Russian levels. In the game it's called Repairing the Wire, but we used to call it Tank Hunt because you were originally just going to hunt down the tanks in the streets of Stalingrad. Then after some testing we realized, hey, this isn't entirely everything it should be, so we need a story for this level. So they came up with this idea that you would be repairing a field phone wire that connected a couple of outposts, and so that's the story. And then later you would destroy tanks. Well, we just saw some friendlies do some cool corner behavior where they uh, step out from the corner, which they didn't do in Call of Duty 1. And uh, we just saw an enemy do it, in fact. So our AI do all sorts of more interesting stuff now like that. That uh, not only looks good, but it helps with the gameplay quite a bit because uh, it's really hard to see and hit the enemies in Call of Duty 1 sometimes. Yeah, you're often shooting at their elbows. They're like poking out behind cover. So now they make a more distinct effort to either be in cover or be exposed and trying to attack you. We did a lot of testing with focus testers on this level. We watched how they played it. Initially, the level was a lot more open-ended, and we noticed that players would often get confused as to where to go. They would get misled by certain cues in the level. So the wire also helped to guide their path. Originally, we were playing somewhat more realistically, where we had the wire being buried under rubble and snow, and they could never see it, so over time, over several tests, it migrated more and more towards the center of the path. Yeah, hopefully people uh, have an easy time getting through this level at this point. All of our tests have been much, much better. <laughs> yeah, we thought it was a cool idea to just have you sort of follow the wire through the level. The main designer on this level was a uh, Swedish guy who became very distraught when players would get lost trying to follow the wire, so after a, a little bit of coaxing we finally we got it uh, a little bit easier. Wait, that was good. That was uh, one of our female soldiers that you'll see in the Russian levels. They're, uh, they're not all through the game, but I think they add a little bit of extra spice and realism. You can see the uh, the weather system picking up here. It's starting to get a little, uh, a little more dense. It changes as you go through the level. So you're seeing the PPSH-41 firing, which we test fired, and uh, it actually has very little recoil in real life. The rifles, by comparison, are extremely powerful in terms of recoil, but we toned that down for gameplay. And uh, we got to uh, use the sounds from the weapon shoot to uh, create the sounds in the game, so we keep it very authentic, as well as getting the you know authentic recoils and animations and textures for the weapons. It's a bit of a funny story about the fire range. Uh, myself and a few other members of the team we placed a bet on who could hit targets with the, uh, the one of the rifles, the SVT-40, shooting at a target about 70 yards away, I think. And uh, I won that bet. As I understand it, it wasn't... <laughs> that, that, was, that, was, that was really funny. It wasn't it's until... Funny part, so the funny part, <laughs> the funny part is that it wasn't until money was on the line that, that Steve assumes this sort of ninja sharpshooter professional pose and, and wins the and I'd, I'd like to point out that I came in second to do a sad thing. Yeah, bit of a ringer. Two shots. <laughs> That's all I took to win. Out of the ten I wanted. Uh, the PPSH is also a favorite weapon with the players just because it has a 70, 70 round clip. People people love that, not that good. It's really not hard to understand why the Soviet Army outfitted huge squads, huge numbers of troops with this one exclusively. Yeah, we can hear the AI talking excessively about the situation that's going on here, talking about the fascists to the south. They really go on and on about the fascists. Yeah, that's uh, what you're hearing is the new battle chatter system, which uh, we recorded 25,000 lines of dialogue for the game to be used throughout the level to uh, provide clues as to what's going on around you. Only a couple thousand are fascist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's more uh, more storage allocated to sound on this game than in the entire Call of Duty 1. It really uh, brings the, uh, the squad to life and makes them more useful, more believable. 
you'll see the player in this demo throws grenades a lot, and what might not be obvious to players is that the uh, Germans will frequently drop grenades when you kill them, so after, you really want to try to use your grenades as much as possible, and then as you run past their bodies, you'll pick up more grenades, and then you can continue to use them and uh, throw the AI for a loop and really get them to move around a bit and then shoot them when they come running out. If you watch for the piano on the third level above there, you may see it fall down. Oh, there it goes. There's the uh, grenade icon on the screen right now. That's uh, an indicator we added to let the player know when there's a grenade in uh, proximity to him that could uh, injure him. As you can see, the AI don't have those. <laughs> when we were testing the game, uh, we found that players were uh, so involved in the combat that they wouldn't have the opportunity to notice nearby grenades, so we really needed to add that. I think it adds a lot to the gameplay. And on, on the AI avoiding grenades, it was uh, it's more fun when your grenades can actually kill AI. Right. <laughs> Sometimes I think testers look at the grenade icon as an indicator that they're supposed to throw a grenade over there, which leads to calamity. Um, I don't think you can overdo the uh, information you give to the player as far as what's going on when you uh, start making games with this much action. See, a auto save just happened right there. We had to add a lot of auto saves to this level. It's, it's a pretty difficult level. The auto save system is smart enough to not uh, auto save if somebody's aiming directly at you or shooting at you, or there's a grenade about to blow up next to you. Yeah, we really uh, push the auto save system. It's very important. Right, especially Although, considering that we took out the player's ability to save and load freely at any time. It was important to have a really good auto-save system. Yeah, hopefully the player never notices it, but uh, I think it would make the game unplayable if we didn't have it. No, it's worth pointing out that you also don't pick up health packs in Call of Duty 2. You Way to focus on the toilet whoever was <laughs> playing this level. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Hey, we got nice toilet art in this game. There's normal maps in the toilet, so... It's appreciated that's specular. Not all that's, in the toilet. <laughs> that's not all that's in the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I made that too. <laughs> Is there a sniper rifle around here? Um, Steve didn't pick it up. Yeah, there's a sniper rifle back there that you want to get and then keep for every folly level. Right, it's by the machine gun. Yeah, if you're a sniper rifle fan, which I am. Oh, oh yeah, it's we the know G43 that. Sniper. So you can really see uh, the level of detail that we were able to uh, achieve in this game. It's you know, tenfold over where we were in the last game, and it uh, really adds to the uh, the level of immersion. We had dedicated environmental artists on Call of Duty 2. They just went through here and detailed stuff like an interior decorator. Lived in these rooms for a while. On that wire, you just passed by. This uh, this level led to a lot of iterations on our objective glow because people used to miss sections of wire and then play through the level and have to go back. So we really cranked up that glow until the player can't possibly miss it. Yeah, in a normal playthrough, this is one of the first levels you encounter where you really have to use your objectives. Um, find a lot of objects placed in the, in the level. We seal the player into this area so you can't, after you do the objective, you can't screw up and backtrack and get lost going back through the first part of the level. Yeah, we had some people do that. I did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir, sticky bombs. Little uh, Saving Private Ryan reference there. So you just dropped a grenade bag, you gotta pick that up. Oh, he's already got four grenades. For a long time, yeah, I used to drop like four distinct grenades like a pinata. And then uh, <laughs> it took us a while until we finally got that replaced with a, a satchel of grenades. Well, players wouldn't know that it would. Sorry, interrupting by my brother. It's a live grenade or a grenade ammo on the ground. Important distinction. You can see our friendlies are moving up with us throughout the level. They scale back the number of friendlies when you're in these tight interior spaces. So that guy just fell down and grabbed his neck, and now if you can sort of see the German on the right, he was crawling away, and now he's out of sight. 
our Germans will try to crawl away to die in a cold corner. There's that taunt. Use some grenades. I like the taunts. That was something that we added pretty late in the game. Really adds a little bit of extra oh, there's variation. <laughs> oh, he's gonna make it. He's reaching for his rifle. Another neat thing to watch out for is uh, if there's a guy hiding at a corner, you can just watch for the press plus. Ooh, shell shells. Yeah, the sound went down. You can't hear the guns anymore. Oh, friendlies are eating it. And now the tank hunt begins. And this, uh, rushing the tanks is a little bit uh, of a suicide mission, but it's a lot of fun. But it gives the players the opportunity to be inventive and like flank around right here and not have to go straight at the uh, objective. That, that imprint that was in the center of the screen was added after watching testers fire the tank for hours. Until they expended <laughs> entire clips and... CR tank is moving around, avoiding the player. Nice little gameplay addition. We're actually going to get a mobility kill on the tank? I don't know about this play thing. <laughs> I think it'll be on this second tank. Let's see it. There are a number of different ways that your friendlies will clear up the interior of the tank. They put up a lot of uh, level specific dirt and in this case, snow when you take moves, which is cool. Oh, are we going to see the tank? Okay. No, that was the uh, blow up. If you put it on the engine or whatever, oh, yeah, it right. blows it up. Yeah. Two different ways to destroy a tank in the snow. Places like this are good places to throw smoke grenades, which a lot of new players, since that's a new addition to Call of Duty 2, it takes a while to get in the habit of using smoke grenades. Yeah, you start each level with four, so it's usually a good idea to try to think about the different places in the level that you might want to throw in. Some levels let you find more, but you always know you have four, so you can... This little area we've added as an alternate route is that used to be a, just one alley, and then players would constantly get mowed down there and not use their smoke grenades. So we added this little detour route so that you can play it without having to use a smoke grenade. You might notice from time to time in the game that there's a uh, there's bicycles placed, and uh, sometimes in you know perhaps not the most appropriate places. But he lives there and past that door. I know he, he rides to work from there, and uh, that's because one of our uh, artists is really into bicycles and placing them. And the same guy, he was a little upset when we cut the uh, Russian tank, which you know makes some of these levels a little harder. I guess you never have any Russian tanks helping you, and. I think we learned something from that for future games to always outfit both sides with at least one heavy mechanized weapon. And bicycles. Uh, bicycles. And bicycles. While we're on the topic of these random objects, if you uh, notice there's sometimes pianos on various interiors throughout the game, you can actually try to play them. That was a Swifty. Just yeah. uh, hit the use yeah, semi Swifty. In fact, it's even mapped out a little bit up and down. Yeah, and you can actually play it. You can play the high notes. Too. So this is actually getting to the section where the uh, original gameplay comes in. Yeah, this is cool because we reuse the original area and let you uh, use what you've learned from the original section. Right, if you plant the explosive on the top, the rear of the tank, that will destroy the tank outright. If you plant it on the wheels at the back, it'll actually create mobility kill. You'll see the tread actually get popped. Wow, I just learned that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and the friendlies come over and... Right. Do the stuff. If the tank stops, ends up stopping at a place where your friendlies can't really get to it, then after a certain amount of time it'll time out and explode on itself. So we actually time. made a model of the tank with the tread destroyed as well. Yeah. Just for that. We personally. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a break. I finished my break. Me and you, Mackie. <laughs> so there's the uh, friendlies going up to take out the rest of the tank. Extreme model. Get away, friendly. He's gonna. Oh. Yay. Oh, no, he probably ate it. 
It's dangerous work. So here is the smoke grenades moment. I'm going to throw all my smoke grenades and cloud up the entire screen. There's a smoke grenade behind that barrel. Yeah, this is a pretty intense moment. You gotta be careful when you're running into these huge smoke clouds because the AI will melee you. They'll come out and just bash you to death. Especially for the higher difficulty levels, it's just one hit and you're gone. So you gotta be very careful. It can work against you. You can see their silhouettes though in the smoke. Right. And they can see yours yep. if you get really close. If you get close enough to see their silhouettes, then you should shoot them. Yeah, then you're in melee range. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, beaten down a few times with someone coming out of the smoke. It's a really scary moment. I enjoyed it. Also in the smoke, the uh, the friendly uh, name pop-up doesn't work, so you can't use that to tell whether or not it's friendly. Or not. In case it's not entirely obvious, you should use uh, ADS a lot in this game and aim at the enemies. ADS is aiming down the side for the uninitiated. And iron sights for people to play other games. Actually, I heard uh, that's the term they use in the Marines. Oh, that's where it comes from. Yeah. I wasn't in the Marines myself. So what are they called shooting from the hip? Does anybody shoot that? Video game characters. Here's a music cue that's playing, composed by Grammar Bell, and recorded in Bratislava. When the Germans tried to use that tank against the Russians, they actually had a really hard time. The T-34 would take it down easily, so they had to build the Tigers and things specifically for the Eastern Front. See there, there's a PPS-42 under the use icon. It's another one of the submachine guns we introduced for COD 2. That's cool. Nice little banana clip on that gun. Okay, the end. Don't forget to subscribe and tell me comments below what you see in the video. And I'll see you later. Goodbye.